good to see everyone here tonight, and uh, I feel quite at home, not only because of uh, Glenn and Irma that I uh, prayed for so much and look with great interest on what God is doing here, but there's almost a dozen folks here from the House of Prayer, and uh, I'm sorry they had to come all the way down to Arkansas to hear me preach, <laughs> but I'll preach to the rest of you too, praise the Lord. And uh, then uh, there's almost uh, half a dozen of us here from Leslie, Arkansas. Praise the Lord. But tonight, I do want to continue on to uh, mention something about what we were talking about last night. And continue that message on because what we are discussing is relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not too interested anymore in doctrines. I have investigated all kinds of doctrines and I've... I've uh, uh, come to the conclusion that there is no end to the creating of new doctrines and new teachings and uh, tangents have run off in every different direction. Uh, when revival comes, and you'll find this especially folks that live along the river, when revival comes, the river just gets filled and the water goes in places where it uh, otherwise normally wouldn't go. Of course, there's always a channel in a river like the Mississippi River, for instance, or some, there's always a channel down the stream, the main stream of the river is flowing. But in the times of revival, that water will spread out and it'll flood. And little streams will go out to the side, little tangents will run off. And when the revival subsides, when the water sort of subsides, then uh, the rain uh, quits falling and the water goes down, you'll find a lot of that water trapped in little bayous or... Uh, little places back up in there, and of course, uh, folks are really they went off on a tangent. They ran their little tangent. This is the key to the revival. This is the key to sonship. This is the key of the kingdom of God. And they're around their little puddle, and pretty soon that little puddle begins to dry up, collect wiggle tails and brush and what have you. And uh, and pretty soon they find themselves, you know, trying to guard their still their little puddle. And pretty soon it's just a little mud hole. And it's all they've got because they've lost the stream, the mainstream of what uh, God is speaking and saying. And so this has happened so many times, and I've got disinterested in uh, a lot of uh, the doctrine as, as such. You know, because doctrine just means teaching, and I'm, I'm still good for teaching. I like to hear teaching, and I want to tell you that uh, you ought to hear those morning teaching services, if at all possible... You be here in the morning services. When I take two pages of notes on a preacher, he's got to be saying something. I want to tell you. Because I can listen to most preachers and, and I've heard about everything they sing. After 40 years in Pentecost, 43 years and over, uh, you just about hear most all of it, you see. And, um, but uh, when, when I take two pages of notes, why, they're saying something that I haven't been hearing. Amen. Or bringing more light upon what I have been hearing. Some of the things Brother Owen was teaching today, I said, Dear Lord, I, I appreciate you giving me all this information on what you gave me by the Spirit. That I didn't have sense enough and intelligent enough and uh, uh, to look up and to find in the Word. But here you are giving me all this information on these truths that have been burning in my heart. Praise God. So I appreciate teachings. But more than this, I appreciate the relationship we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in Him resides the purposes of God. Paul said unto me, Who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now, under principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So all of the purposes of God, the eternal purpose of God, has been purposed in Jesus Christ. And so in Him resides this whole program. I mean, it was a revelation to me one day. My wife and I were leaving a camp meeting from, in Springfield, and I'd been preaching, you know, beating around the, the edges of a lot of this stuff, and, and uh, we were exhausted when this camp meeting was over, and I had to get out of town for a while and take a rest, and we had some friends in Kansas invite us over for a few days just to rest, and so my wife and I were driving over there, and I was sitting in the car. Uh, I was driving, and she was sitting there, and I was singing. 
She's about the only one that can put up with my singing. And uh, that's because she loves me. And um, more than you do. And so, uh, but I was singing, and I was singing three words. Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ the Lord. I was singing Jesus Christ. Three most beautiful words in human history. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, just like a light. Somebody flipped a switch on and the light went on. This, in these three words, are contained the whole message that I've been trying to preach. All in Jesus Christ, Lord. First of all, Jesus means Savior. Jesus in the Greek, Joshua in the Hebrew, it means Savior, Deliverer. And when we talk about Jesus, we're talking about our salvation. Thou shalt call His name Jesus, because He shall save His people from their sin. Hallelujah. And so, the, the very name Jesus speaks to us of that first gate that brings us in the tabernacle, that brings us into the outer court, to the altar of blood, the burnt offering. Jesus, the gate, I am the door. No man can come into me. This thing is seven and a half feet high, by the way, this wall around here. Too high to get over, too low to get under. You've got to come in at the door. You ever seen that little chorus? Well, this is the door. And it's Jesus. He's the door. But there's another door. Hallelujah. It's made of the same material. Same amount of material. It's the same one. It's Jesus again. Because the second door is Christ. And Christ is a Greek word, Christos. And Christ means the anointed one. I want to get into that a little bit in the Scripture here in a minute. But Christ means the anointed one. And when we speak of Christ, we speak of the anointing. How Jesus, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He was the anointed one who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So he was anointed. And that anointing... Christ speaks of that anointing in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And John the Baptist said, There's one coming after me who is mightier than I am, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with power. So it's Jesus Christ who saves us, and it's Jesus Christ that baptizes us in the Holy Ghost. But there's another door. And that door brings us into his lordship, into his kingship. God brother has on the chart over here. I, I ought to bring his chart out and preach it to you. It wasn't here this morning. Hallelujah. I'm so full of it, you know. But anyhow... Uh, when you go in there, that's where the kings and priests are. You go in as a priest, you come out as a king. Uh, you'd have to have been here this morning to hear that. All right. But we'll tantalize them a little bit. Say, but... All right. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry if you couldn't make it. I'm sorry. You, probably, uh, uh, you forgive me. But, but you see, his lordship is in behind that third veil. And he's going to have a people, his sons, his overcomer, his king priest company, that are going to be totally under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of saved people that are not 100% totally under His Lordship. Now, come on. Born-again preachers that throw people out of their church because they speak in tongues. That's not the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people speaking tongues that are not under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They have the second experience. Throw preachers out of their denomination because they see a greater vision. That's not the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I went through that. Hallelujah. I had the blessing of being excommunicated. I tried to resign. Hallelujah. I was going to get out the easy way, you know. And God said, oh, no, son. <laughs> I'm going to give you a blessing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But I was excommunicated for what I was preaching and what I was seeing in God. Not because I run up with somebody else's wife or stole some money from the church or anything like that, you see. Amen but because of the message. And thank God, I, I, I bear that scar uh, proudly, willingly. Hallelujah. I love that. I thank you for it, Lord. I don't hate the people that did that. I love them for it. That's the biggest blessing they ever did for me. Hallelujah. That's a greater blessing than when they ordained me to the ministry. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ the Lord, in Him resides everything. And all we get out of Him from our salvation, from the Holy Ghost, from sonship, comes through the door. And he is that door. And it was him, his flesh, that third veil. It says, Hebrews 10 tells us that that's his flesh that was rent at Calvary. When the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, providing us a place to come into the Holy of Holies. Wherefore, only the high priest could go in himself. And once a year, now we have access into that place through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
And we have access to His Lordship. Praise the Lord. Now, that's just an introduction to tell you that it's our relationship that I want to explore tonight. First of all, we have a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ as a son. Amen. We read the scripture last night in Isaiah that tells us that He is the everlasting Father. No question about it. Who it was talking about? It was talking about the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ our Lord. That He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. But if He's an everlasting Father, He must have a son. And so we investigated and we found that that Isaiah said in chapter 53. When he looked at this man, he said, How is this? Here's a man, the only perfect man that's ever come. He grew up as a root out of a dry ground. He was the only one. He was the promised one. And yet he said, He was cut off from the land of the living. Who's going to declare his generation? Who's going to carry on his life in the earth? Is he going to be the last of his kind? He was the first of his kind. Now, is he going to be the last of his kind? Is this generation going to be cut off without leaving any seed in the earth? And then he said, oh, no, he got a revelation. He said, when the Lord shall make his soul an offering for sin, then he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his life in the land. Hallelujah. His days shall be prolonged in the land when his soul is made an offering for sin. Why? Because he brings forth sons. In his own likeness. Hallelujah. And so, Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that Jesus Christ is going to bring many sons unto glory. And over in the book of Revelation chapter 21, we read the verse and I want to read it again. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Alright, that's speaking about our inheritance. And this is Jesus Christ speaking. He said, I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'll give to him that's a thirst of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I, Jesus will be his God, and he, the overcomer, will be my son. Amen. Here's where his son comes forth. An overcomer to sit with him on his throne. The brother pointed out of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the throne of God in the Holy of Holies, in that tabernacle. Hallelujah. All the things that God is revealing by that. Amen. I was taught, I was introduced to that. I think it was the 19... 46 or 47, that my teacher in Bible school gave us a textbook and said, we're going to study. This is typology. And we started studying about Moses' tabernacle. I never hardly heard about Moses' tabernacle before. All of a sudden, a whole new world opened up to me. Amen. I went around the next summer. I had an artist draw me pictures of all that furniture. I went around preaching in Bibles about the furniture of the tabernacle. Amen. That was in 47. I want to tell you, 30 years later, Almost about 25 to 30 years later. I was back in Springfield and I was fellowshipping with that teacher that had taught me over 25 years before. And I was sharing with him some of the truths that God was bringing to me out of the tabernacle and showing him where it was in the scripture. And he said, I didn't know that. How come that a student... 25 years later, can show his teacher something, and the teacher, because he had never moved an inch, he was locked up behind the boundaries of denominational walls that don't permit you to look behind beyond where they tell you. And as a result, his vision had never been enlarged. He was still teaching after 25 years the same identical truths that he taught me in Bible school. He had never enlarged his vision in that. I couldn't teach this for 25 years without getting enlarged. I get enlarged every time I talk about it. Every time I hear Ellen would talk about it, I get enlarged in my vision about this. But on this throne, there's three of them that sit on that throne. He that overcometh shall sit with me on my throne as I have overcome and sit with my Father in His throne. So the Father sits on the throne, Jesus sits on the throne, and the overcomer sits on the throne. Hallelujah. And He said, The overcomer shall be my Son. So there is a relationship there that we have with the Lord Jesus as sons. In the book of uh, Galatians, glory to God. Book of Galatians and um, chapter 3. Now, first, I want to read chapter 4 because I think I can dispense with that pretty quickly and get to the point that I want to continue in here in chapter 3. And that is, now I say that the heir, and he's talking about our inheritance here, which comes by sonship. And the book of Hebrews says that the inheritance isn't effective. It, is no, of no, uh, it isn't uh, the testament and the covenant, the inheritance, isn't in effect until 
the testator dies. And when Jesus died, he put our inheritance in force. Hallelujah. And he wants us to know the contents of his will. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. That is, the placing into the body as full-grown sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, we are sons, and we are heirs. It says it very plainly. It cannot be twisted in any way. But go back with me to the third chapter of the book of Galatians. And he says, beginning here in the... Um, Thirteenth verse, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might, we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then verse 16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but... As of one, and to thy seed, Abraham, which is Christ. Now I said to the Lord the first time I discovered that scripture, and I was getting all excited about how that the blessings were coming up of Abraham, coming upon me, you know, and I was going to receive. How many of you know that most of us love ourselves? We're supposed to love our neighbors like ourselves. We're supposed to love our wives as our own flesh. God knows we're supposed to love ourselves. He wants us to take care of ourselves. Amen. But I was looking out for me and I was saying, Lord, where do I fit in this? Because right here it says that only two people are getting these promises. Abraham and Christ. It says it very plainly. Not to seeds as many, but the one seed, Christ. So to Abraham and Christ are the only one that promises come to. That's just as plain as you can read it. Can't twist that any. So I said, where does that leave me? He said, read a little further. So I begin to read a little further and I get down here to verse 26. Hallelujah. Now we are all, you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, and there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, that is, if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now he says, the promises belong to Abraham and to his seed, Christ. But he said, if you belong to Jesus Christ, then you are heirs according to the promise. You are that Christ is talking about back there in verse 13. Hallelujah. Now, the anointed one. Hallelujah. I want to go over here into the book of Revelation, chapter 11, and verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. All right. Now, first of all, who is our Lord? Jesus. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Hallelujah. He declared that he was the Lord. We had that last night. We had it on the... Uh, overhead here the chart to show you all the scriptures, not all the scriptures, but many of the scriptures that say that Jesus Christ is Lord. So it says here that the kingdoms of this world are going to come the kingdoms of our Lord, of our Lord Jesus, and of his Christ. And he shall reign, not they shall reign, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. All right. If Jesus is Lord... Then who is his Christ, his anointed? Turn to chapter 2 of the book of Psalms. Praise the Lord. Chapter 2 of the book of Psalms. And he starts out by saying, Why do the heathen rage? Now remember these wording because there is a scripture here in Acts. I want to go to a midi after which quotes this. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. There's the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that setteth in the heaven shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. So the Lord is the one sitting in the heavens, and, and it said, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore pla displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of thee, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Amen. Turn with me to chapter 4 of the book of Acts before we go back to Revelation. Now Peter and John went down in chapter 3 in the book of Acts and healed a lame man. And for that they got put in jail for the night. And after spending the day and night in jail, they took him out, they examined him, they threatened him, and after threatening him, they let him go home. And so it said in verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own company. Well, I love that term, their own company. Isn't it nice to have an own company? You know, we have so many wandering stars floating around, don't belong to nobody. They're not committed to anyone. Uh, they'll come and enjoy the preaching. They'll come and get out of the cold, rather, with the building that somebody has built. But they're not committed. Not here, not there, not anywhere. They just don't have a company. They're on to themselves. Nobody's going to discipline them. Nobody's going to uh, uh, rebuke them. Nobody's going to correct them. They're just a law to themselves. They don't have a company. But praise God, these people had a company of their own. They belong to somebody. And I'm not trying to build another denomination. But I'm just telling you, that it's wonderful to have your own company. A people that love you. A people that you are married to in the Spirit. A people that you are committed to. Amen. And they committed to you. And he said, they went to their own company and reported to all the chief priests and elders said to them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in the earth. Now, I want to tell you, last night, we read the scriptures in John, Gospel of John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 2, Revelation chapter uh, 4, where it describes who it is that made, that created heaven and earth. And there was no question, the Bible left no uh, doubt as to who it is that created heaven and earth. It was Jesus Christ, the Word, who said all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is the head of the body of the church. Now, it's just that plain. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, 15, 16, 17, it says there that, that the head of the body, the church, who is Jesus Christ, is the one who created all things. Principalities, powers, everything's created. He created them. And they're talking to him here. Think of it. And they say, Lord, we know you're the one that created heaven and earth and all that is. And he said, that, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Amen. Now, the book of Psalms says against the Lord and against his anointed. But he's saying the same thing. And they're quoting him here. And they say, against the Lord and against his Christ. For have a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. Now, that's in the past. That's over with. They, they were gathered together against the Lord. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determines for to do. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand. Amen. Now, what they're saying is that the psalmist had already declared that the kings of the earth were going to come against the Lord and against his anointed, and they reminded God, now they did come against your holy child Jesus. And he is on high now. But now what we're talking about is they're still coming against this Christ, the body, the anointed one, this body of Jesus Christ. And that's the one they're coming against. All right? Now, what did it say over here about this one in Psalms 2? It says, 
Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, and verse 26. And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. This is Jesus speaking, by the way, and he's speaking about you, the overcomer. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. Revelation chapter 12 says this about the man-child. And she, was, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Praise God. Now, as... Jesus is to his Father, so we are to him. As he overcame and sat down in the Father, with, with the Father in his throne, he said, so you, overcomer, will sit down with me in my throne. As the Father gave him a rod to rule all nations, he said, I'm giving that rod to you to rule the nations. Amen. As he was the body of the Father, the Revelation, or 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, said, I would have you know that the head of every uh, man is Christ, the head of the woman is a man, and the head of Christ is God. So as He is the expression of God, the body through which God, His head, expresses Himself, so we are the body through which He, the head of the church, expresses Himself. Everything He is to the Father, we are to Him. That is why that many of the scriptures that speak about the Christ, the Son of God, refer to Him in His relationship to the Father, but it also refers to us in our relationship to Him. Now that's a little hard to get a hold of right at first, but search the scriptures. Because I don't want to labor this point and go on into this because I want to bring you to another relationship, and that is our relationship to Him as our elder brother. For it says in Romans 8, 28 and 29, for well, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate, that we might be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. And Hebrews chapter 2 says that Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call us brethren, and it quotes an Old Testament scripture where He calls us His brethren, to prove that we are his brethren and he is our elder brother. Praise the Lord. I want to talk tonight about two brothers and about their relationship and about the desire that the older brother has for his younger brother, what he desires for him, because this relates directly to us as the younger brother. Now, we said the other night, that this second Adam has multiplied himself and become a corporate man, just like the first Adam did. The second man in the earth. Amen. The last Adam. He's a corporate man. And I want you to see the body of Jesus Christ as one person. One man. And I want you to see him tonight as a younger brother. To the elder brother. And that relationship we have with the elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now... That's not our only relationship. We understand that he has a relationship with his church as a bride and a bridegroom. He has a relationship as a father and a son. He has a relationship to us as an elder brother and a younger brother. You say, how can he be all these things? He's much more than that, friends. He's a head of a body. He's a cornerstone of the temple. He's a seed of the harvest. He's a lot of things. He's everything to us. See, all of these things. As a diamond has many facets, you look in and you see all these beautiful colors in, in a many faceted diamond. So there's many uh, relationships that he has to us, and all of them are true relationships, and they're pictured to us in the Word of God. And the one I want to talk about tonight is the relationship as a brother. And that is found in the book of uh, Genesis, chapter, let me begin in chapter 29. This is a story. First of all, I want to start with a story of the, uh, how these two brothers came into the world. Amen. They had some half-brothers, which I'm not too interested in, in discussing tonight. But these two brothers, uh, it's a very, very beautiful story. 
It's one of the most beautiful love stories in the Bible. And it concerns um, a twin brother, the younger of two twins, who went out because his older brother was about to kill him, Esau, the man of the flesh. And Jacob escaped, and his mother said, You go see my brother over my brother Laban. You remember the story of how that uh, Abraham sent his servant Eliezer over to get a bride for Isaac. Went way over in a far country because he didn't want to marry the heathen, the pagans around him. Didn't want his son marrying these heathen girls, bringing their heathen gods in. Said, send back and get those who believe in the true and living God. And so he went back and he found Rebecca, And he brought her. And she left her family, her mother and father and her brother Laban. And she came to this far country. And do it in as much as they didn't have the bell system back then. They couldn't, uh, uh, what is it, um, well they say, you know, sit down and make a little call and say hello to them. And they couldn't send word to them that often. So Laban didn't know much what was happening with his beloved sister over there. Until years later. And she had this um, son and uh, um, Jacob and here he came. And so he went to look for his uncle Laban. And uh, he traveled to the land of the east. And it's beautiful how the Lord guides our steps when we're moving in the purposes of God. A lot of people are so afraid they're going to miss sonship. Oh, Brother Burton, they're wringing their hands and saying, what, what must I do to make it in? Well, the first thing I say is relax. Just relax. Hey, he's going to bring you in. Hallelujah. You call, he's going to bring you in. Just learn to love him and enjoy him. Hallelujah. Enjoy the things He does for you. Things he, don't get hung up on the things He gives you. Don't get lost in the gift. Just love the giver and uh, relax. But you see, He will guide the steps of those that are in His purposes. And so it was with Jacob. All that long journey across the desert, He arrives over in the land of the east and He walks up to a well and He sees some men around the well and He said, uh, why aren't you watering your sheep? They said, well, we have to wait until everybody gets here. The man of authority has to roll the stone away and then we'll water them and so forth. And they say, uh, so he said, well, say, while we're waiting, any of you fellows happen to know a man I'm looking for by the name of Laban? Why, sure, we know him. He's a neighbor. He says, as a matter of fact, there's his daughter coming with her sheep to be watered today. The timing of God is so perfect. I've had that work out in my life so beautiful. Hallelujah. Just last April, when the terrible tornado hit Wichita Falls, Texas, I had been directed to the Lord in our travelings to go to Wichita Falls. Stopped with a young minister that was traveling with me and driving for me, and we stopped in Wichita Falls and had supper, and I had a telephone number in my pocket. I thought, well, I'll call the brother and go out and have fellowship with him tonight, maybe spend the night, because it wasn't due the next, till the next day to the camp meeting in Oklahoma. And so, the more I thought about it, the more witness I got that I shouldn't do that. I just, something that just say to me, just go on, go on, just go on. So, don't, don't call nobody. So, I told Lee, I said, well, let's just go on. I called the, I called the people in Oklahoma and told them we're coming on up. And they said, okay. So, we got in the car, drove out. Just an hour later, about a third of the city was wiped out, including where we had supper. The timing of God. And God showed me some things through that timing. He knew what was going to happen. And it's important to just obey the Spirit, to learn to walk in the Spirit and obey the Spirit. And Jacob was walking in the purpose of God for that hour. And God overruled his carnality. God overruled his deceitfulness. He was a deceitful man. But the purposes of God overrule a lot of the little things in us that would trip us up. A lot of people are so afraid. Well, I did, I failed, I, I failed God. I, I did so and so, I've lost out. God will never have me in His sonship group again. Listen, the purpose of God in your life will overrule some of the mistakes that you make. You just repent of those mistakes, straighten those things up with God, and go on. Hallelujah. Now, they said, there she comes. There's one of his daughters coming up there with the sheep. So he introduced himself, greeted her, said, I'm your cousin. I'm uh, uh, Rebecca's. Uh, Rebecca's uh, son, and I want to meet your father Laban. They rushed home, and after they watered the sheep, they rushed on home, and they, uh, she introduced him to her father and said, here's uh, Jacob, your sister's boy, and they just had a great time. Called in her friends, had a feast, you know, and had a wonderful time, and he stayed around for a month. And during the time that he was staying around there, 
everything he do, did was being blessed of God. And Laban noticed this. And Laban was a wily old brother. Amen. I mean, Jacob found out what side of the family his deceitfulness had come from. It didn't come from Isaac. <laughs> it came through his mother. <laughs> and Laban let that be known real quick. But after a month, Laban was noticing something. That everything Jacob did was blessed. And I believe this is the right and the privilege of those that are called of God and walking in the purpose of God. I believe that everything they do should be blessed of God. And I believe everywhere they go, they should bless people. And that's one thing that I have asked. One thing that I have uh, insisted uh, that the Lord would, would give me in my ministry, that where I go, I'd be able to leave a blessing behind and not a curse. That churches would be built up and made strong and not split and torn apart. That people would be drawn closer to God and not divided and confused. I believe we have the right to be blessed of God. And I've seen that happen. And God has graciously, by His love and His grace, has done that for me. Amen. But Jacob had this. And Laban noticed that. And Laban, realizing that the longer he kept Jacob, the more he was going to be blessed, began to want to make a deal to keep him around a while. And he said to him, uh, Son, he said, uh, What can we do? I want to treat you right here. I want you to stay here. I want to give you some wages. He says, what will it take? Let's, let's have a contract here. And, uh, of course, their word was their contract, you know. And he said, let's, uh, let's have a contract. What will it take to keep you around here working uh, for me? And it didn't take but a month until Jacob was head over heels, wildly, madly in love with Rachel. The Bible says that Laban had two daughters. The oldest one, Leah, was weak-eyed and rather homely, wasn't too pretty, and uh, probably had some other problems. But Rachel was beautiful of face and figure. She was very attractive, and Jacob loved Rachel. Boy, there was a lot contained in that simple statement. He was head over heels. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Didn't take but a month for him to find out this was his destiny. This girl. He was going he had to have her at any cost. He said, I'll work for you for seven years for your daughter Rachel. And so Jacob uh, Laban said, That's a deal. Who have I'd rather have her to marry than you? And so uh, uh, he they made a deal. So he worked. And those seven years it said and she must have been quite a young girl. I don't know how old she was, but um, she was a little ways from getting married. They married kind of young back there and and uh, so he was willing to wait seven years for her to grow to her full age of marriage. So she was a, a, a fairly young girl, but a very beautiful girl. And so for seven years he worked. And they said that seven years just passed so quickly because of the great love that Rachel and Jacob had for one another. And finally, the seven years was up. And they're going to have a wedding. And so they call all the friends in. And they get all the wine... Skins filled up, you know. And I don't try to justify their morals back there. I, I don't believe in having two wives. I don't even believe in drinking wine. A lot of things I don't believe in that they did back there. But I'll tell you what happened. They had a feast. And by the time the feast is over, and I just suspect, and I'm filling in, because this actually happened to real people like you and I. And I'm just confident, knowing the character and the nature of old Laban, that he had somebody primed to keep filling up Jacob's glass throughout the feast. Until, by the time the feast was over, he couldn't see too good. And they had the bride come in, all veiled and everything, consummated the marriage, and off they went to the wedding tent. And the next morning, when the light of day came, and Jacob's head was clear, and his eyes could see good, and he woke up and found out that he has married... Not to Rachel, his beloved, but to her ugly sister, Leah. He came out of that tent in a fury. Now, I could read you. It takes about 25 chapters in the Bible to tell this story. Anything God says in 25 chapters must be pretty important. I think there's about four or five references to tongues in the book of Acts. And, uh, and I think that's enough. That, that's enough for me to preach for 40 years on, on uh, tongues, see? I, I wouldn't demand any more than that. But when he says 25 chapters on something, I believe there's something he's telling us. But he came out of that tent in a fury looking for Laban, who I suspect 
had two of his best bodyguards around knowing what was about to happen. And he came up in the storm and said, What did you do to me? Why would you treat me like this? I worked seven years expecting to have Rachel as my wife. Oh, Laban says, Son, didn't I explain to you the law of the land? Uh, you mean I didn't tell you the customs we have here? Seven years and I hadn't explained to you about the, the law around here? The law says, the custom of the land is, that the younger daughter cannot get married until the older daughter is married. And nobody wanted the older daughter and she couldn't get married off. So, there was no, no way I could let my younger daughter be married until the older is married. Nobody else wanted her. So that was the only way I could do it. I right, said, so tell you what we'll do. Now that the older is married, the young one's eligible. And everybody wants her. So I'll tell you what we'll do. You have a week's honeymoon with Leah. And after her week is up, and her, give her a week's honeymoon, and then next week we'll have another wedding. And you can work another seven years for Rachel. What could he say? I mean, he's going to leave Rachel for the next guy to get? No, not on your lives. That's his beloved. He, there was no way. And so he said, all right. So they had a honeymoon, which I suspect wasn't too pleasant for Leah. But when it was over, he had another wedding. And he married Rachel. All right, let's stop right there. Now, now Jacob's got two wives. One of them is by the law. And one of them is by grace, his beloved. Because he hadn't worked a day for her yet. See? He's married to her. The wedding's consummated. And yet he hadn't worked a day for her. He thought he was working for her. But he wasn't working for her. He was working for the law. Working by the law of the land. Hallelujah. But he's got this wife that he's not too crazy about now. But he worked for her. He labored. He thought he was going to get in by his work. But it didn't work that way. Now he's got another one he hasn't worked a day for. How many of you know that your beloved is not going to come by work? Hallelujah. But after you get her, after you come in, then you're going to work all right. He's going to put you to work. But you don't get it by works. Does that make sense to you? Oh, I tell you what, it's a, beloved, it's a beautiful time to work for God after you have received all this by grace. It makes you want to work then. Hallelujah. So, they started their life. They started the next seven years. And meanwhile, God looked at Leah and how she was hated. And He had mercy on her and began to give her sons. Now, it was a, it was a very um, um, honorable thing back there. In fact, almost a necessary thing for a wife to bear her husband a son to carry on his name and his life in the earth. Carry on the inheritance. And so, Leah began to have sons. The first one came along, she named him Reuben, behold, a son. The next one came along, she named him Simeon, meaning God has heard me, means hearing. And the next one came along, Levi, and then Judah. She was praising God. And let's stop right there. And I want to show you a picture of something's going on here. The law is just working like mad. It's producing all of them, and grace hasn't shown a thing yet. And... Rachel's out there crying and begging God, and she's begging her husband. He said, I'm not God. I can't do anything for you. He said, just God shut up your womb. And she's bombarding heaven constantly about this. Hallelujah. I wonder, you know, God had a reason for this. God was working out His purposes, and as much as He loved Rachel, He had to just shut His ears to her cries. Do you ever feel like that God wasn't listening to you when you prayed? Do you ever feel like God just doesn't hear you when you pray? He hears. But He may be working out a bigger purpose in your life than you realize. One time in 19... Uh, uh, hallelujah. 56, I think it was. I, was. I was at a camp meeting down in Mobile, Alabama. And I left the camp after the evening service one night to go to St. Louis to get my wife and family to go to another camp down in northern Arkansas. And um, so... Driving up the highway, up through Mississippi, why, um, I was driving along and, and I was just praying and seeking God and it was, well, that 20 years ago, 22 years ago, I was quite a bit younger and I could handle this preaching all night and driving on the next, all the next night and so forth. That, that's a little past me right now, but I was driving along and I was just praying and seeking God and, and God began to unveil to me the manifestation of the sons of God. I began to see what I saw was I saw a son of God moving through the land. I saw the ministry of a, of a son of God. 
And I saw him moving, and God showed me. And the anointing of the Spirit was so heavy in that car, I couldn't drive the car. I was on a straight highway on the flat part of Mississippi, just going, there was no hills, there was no curves, and there was no traffic on the road. And I couldn't hold the car in the road. I had to pull over the side of the road, shut the car off, and sit there, gripping that steering wheel, and just talking in tongues, and seeing the vision that God was giving me about this thing. And after that, I began to, I, I began to beg God all the time. I said, God, let that come to pass now. I'm, I'm out of the system now. I'm free. i got no hindrances. Let me enter into that. And every day I was crying out to God, begging Him, let me enter into that. And I was just bombarding heaven for the birth of that son. And about the 1st of January, up in uh, 57, uh, I was up in Cleveland, Ohio. And we were going home from church one night, and this young lady was on her way to the mission field, and she was uh, riding home with, uh, with us in the car with a pastor and his family. And she said to me, sort of timidly, she said, uh, Brother Britton, uh, she said, the Lord gave me a word for you, but I, I don't know what I can give to you or not. I said, oh yeah, oh yeah, the Lord gave you a word. He gave you to give to me. Come on now, what is it? She said, I, I don't know what I want to say it or not. She said, I said, you go to say it, sister. I said, he gave you a word for me. I want to hear it. She said, I'm bombarding heaven every day. See, now I knew he was going to answer me somewhere or other. And so she said, I don't think it's what you want to hear. I said, never mind that I'll be the judge. You just tell me what he said. She said, well, the Lord says that what you've been asking him for and what you've been praying about is coming, but this ain't the time for it and not to bother him now. <laughs> Quit bugging him. Now, she didn't use the word bugging, but that's what she meant. Quit bugging him about it. And that wasn't what I wanted to hear. And Rachel just kept praying and begging God for a child. And little Leah... Here she come out, her poor little lad behind her, you know. And she'd take a detour around by Rachel's tent, you know. Come on, lads, we're going to do the chores now. Come on, boys. And here's these little old husky boys coming along. And they were, they were healthy, husky, rough, shod, mean. They, you ought to read the story of these fellows. Reuben, Levi, Simeon, and Judah. And see some of the things they got into. Boy, they were some rough customers. And here they were, those four little old fellows, following their mommy around. And uh, they walked by their... Her sister, Rachel's tent, and she said, Good morning, Sister Rachel. Any uh, good news? Poor Rachel. Burning with jealousy. Burning with frustration and disappointment. Is that how you ever felt when you've looked at the systems of the world around here prospering? Building their big works. Their big cathedrals going up. People chasing after this one. Chasing after that one. And not hearing the voice of the sun. Have you ever felt that way? And poor Rachel. Finally, she went to Jacob. She said, Jacob, if I can't have a son, I've got to have one to rock in my arms even if it isn't mine. So take my slave girl and marry her and give me a, a stepson anyhow. And so he did. He went into Bilhah and she had two sons. And so Rachel raised them as stepsons. But about that time, Leah decided she was getting gained on and the Lord shut up her womb. And so she said to Jacob, said, you've given her... Uh, two steps on, give me two, uh, give me a step on, go in and marry my uh, slave girl. So he did, and uh, so he had two more sons through Zilpah. So now, um, he has eight sons. And then Leah has two more sons. God opens up her womb and she has two more. Now Jacob has ten sons, four by servants and six by the law, and none by grace. The servants and the law. You know, Jesus said to his brothers one time, when his brothers said to him at the Feast of Tabernacle, John chapter 7, they said, well, hey, the big feast has happened up in Jerusalem. said, well, why don't you go up and show yourself? said, you've got all this stuff, because his brothers, they said, didn't believe in him. But they were baiting him. And he said, you get all these miracles? said, you want to be known? You want to be a big name for yourself? said, that's where the, that's where the crowds are? Go up where the crowds are and produce your miracles and, and get yourself a big name. And he looked at him and said, fellas, he said, you can do your thing just any time because this is your day. But the son can't move just any time. He has to wait till he hears from the father. And he had to wait till he heard from the father and the feast was about half over before he could get up there to it. Hallelujah. But you see, here they were. Ten sons and a daughter and none of them by Rachel. And then the Bible says a beautiful thing. And it says, and God remembered Rachel. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived 
and bear a son. Now you would have thought that after all this time and these other ten boys being born out here, that finally she's got a beautiful, healthy little baby boy that she'd leave God alone and just enjoy having finally given Jacob a son. Which, by the way, was going to be the greatest son that he ever had. Was the priest of the house. Was a boy that was willing to lay his life down for morality and for righteousness. Which his brothers wouldn't do. His brothers were in all kinds of wickedness. Two of them went in and slew a whole city through deceitfulness. One of them went in and, and defiled his, uh, his uh, father's wife. One of them went out there to a harlot and was about to, his own stepdaughter, I mean his uh, daughter-in-law, went into her thinking she was a harlot. Oh, I tell you, those guys, they would do most anything. But Jake, Joseph, not him. He would go to jail before he'd, uh, he'd uh, uh, commit an uh, immoral act. What a boy. And you would have thought that Rachel, now that she had a son, would say, I'm satisfied. This is, I'll spend my time raising him. But you know the first thing she said? She began to prophesy about another son. I mean, before, as soon as this one was born, she started prophesying about another one. Listen to it. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. I mean, they named him when they was eight days old. Circumcised him and named him. And he wasn't here eight days so she was prophesying about another one coming. Glory to God. Joseph. Joseph means adding. And his brothers hated him. And it says that, first thing she said, God has taken away my reproach. Now I want to show you very quickly here, which I don't think it would take much persuasion to show you that Joseph is a beautiful type in the Scripture of the Lord Jesus Christ. First thing she said about him, he's taken away my reproach. Who is it when he came into the world took away our reproach? It was Jesus. Amen. We were reproached by sin. By the dryness, the inability to produce God's image. till Jesus came. When He came, He took away our reproach. And then Jacob said, As soon as Joseph was born, look what Jacob said. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. And you know, as soon as Jesus comes into our life, that's what we want to do is get out of this old Babylonian country. And come into our own country. Do you know we have our own place? We have our own inheritance. We have a land of righteousness and peace and joy and love. We, we can get out of this land of confusion and sin and darkness. And that's what Jacob said. As soon as Joseph was born, he wants to get out. Now, when he was a young boy, Jacob made him a coat of many colors. And that word coat of many colors, in other translations it says a a distinctive tunic with sleeves. And actually what it is, is a coat of priesthood. It designated him as the priest of the house. Because back then they didn't have a priestly tribe. Had, Moses hadn't come along yet. And the twelve tribes hadn't been separated out and named one of them as a priest tribe. And so each patriarchal home had one uh, person in it uh, to do the honors of, uh, of approaching God for the family. And Joseph was the one that's designated for that. He was called out particularly for it. And his brothers hated it. They were jealous of him. And you know, when Jesus came into this world, he had a garment of priesthood on. Not the old order of the Levitical priesthood, but he had a garment of the Melchizedek order upon him. And the priest of the land around him hated him for that. Why? Because, you see, the Bible says, I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. And laws were given how that men could get rid of leprosy and other things by bringing them to God doing things. And the priest was the one who was supposed to do this. But you didn't find the priest in Jesus day healing anybody. When Jesus came, he began to heal the lepers. He began to raise the dead. He began to feed the people. He began to perform the functions of a Melchizedek priesthood. And the other brethren hated him for it. They were jealous of him, see, of his priesthood. Joseph, when he was sold by his brothers, as Jesus was, sold down into slavery, and Jesus, it said, left his glory, stripped himself, and came down and took upon himself the form of a man, and abased himself even to become a slave. 
And as Joseph was a slave in Potiphar's house, God so blessed him in the state, even though he lived on right along with the other slaves there, God so blessed him that Potiphar turned the key over to him. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Wednesday evening, December 26, 1979. Midwinter Camp Meeting, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. This is tape two of two tapes by Bill Britton entitled, Two Brothers. So blessed him that Potiphar turned the key over to him and said, Here, Joseph, you take the key to the storehouse. Anybody needs anything, you feed them. Anybody needs clothes, you clothe them. Anybody has any needs, you take care of all my business here. Even though he's still a slave, he had the key to the storehouse. And even though Jesus lived here on earth, among all the other slaves, the human race, himself in the form of a slave. Yet he had the key to the storehouse. Any of the other slaves needed to be healed. They needed food. They needed something. He had the key. He could open the storehouse and give it to them. And then Joseph was falsely accused. The old wicked harlot tried to get him to put his life into her. Just as Satan tried to get that life of the Holy Son of God to bow down to him. But Joseph wouldn't do it. And he was falsely accused and put into prison. And when those bars clanged behind him, when that gate shut behind him in that prison house, that was not a 90-day sentence. That was not in for three years out on good behavior in 18 months. When that gate shut behind him, that was for life. There was no way out. He was shut up. That was death to a normal life. When he went into that prison house as far as the natural man's concern, he was dead to life anymore. And when Jesus went to that cross, brother, they considered him dead. He went into the prison house of death. But thank God that in God's hour, God raised Joseph out of that prison house and set him in one day upon that throne beside himself to rule all Egypt. See? And so God raised Jesus out of that tomb and brought him up and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly place to rule and reign over all of his creation. And all power, he said, is given to me in heaven and in earth. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus, or Joseph, is a beautiful picture and a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was the elder brother. But as soon as he was born, his very name meant, Joseph I'm talking about, meant there's another son coming. And those brothers that hated him, boy, they did. They called him uh, you know, that dreamer. And uh, the father loved him so much and all that. And they hated him for it. But you know, every time they would say to him, Hey, little Joe. Hey, Joseph. Papa's darling. Every time they call him Joseph. You know what they're doing? They're prophesying. They're prophesying another son's coming. Rachel's going to have another son. Every time they holler Joseph, that's what they're doing. They're prophesying. And you want to know something? Every time somebody calls upon Jesus, every time they mention his name, they're prophesying. Because the very birth of Jesus into this world, and the very thing when he came into this world to do, he said, I've got to lay my life down to bring forth the harvest. I've got to, I've got, the reason I've come into this world is to bring forth many sons to glory. And every time somebody mentions Jesus, they're talking about a prophecy, another son is coming. Hallelujah. All right. Now that son came. I want to talk about him. Over in chapter 35. Hallelujah. First of all, when they left, now I want you to notice something over here in chapter uh, 32. Uh, Jacob fled from Laban's house. He started back home, but he was concerned about what his brother Esau would do when he got back home. He was worried about that. So, on the way back home, he got off one night and began to wrestle with a man. This is in chapter 32 of Genesis. And he wrestled all night. And this man happened to be the angel of the Lord or the presence of the Lord himself. And all night, God's wrestling with Jacob. You know the story quite well, I'm sure. 
And at the break of day, the man said, Jacob, let, or he said to him, let me go. And Jacob said, I won't let you go till you bless me. I'm not going to turn you loose till you bless me. And he said to Jacob, he said, what's your name? Now, would you consider that a moment? God has been wrestling with a man all night and don't even know what his name is. Don't know who he's wrestling with. Why does he have to ask him his name after wrestling with him all night? Sure, God knows who he's wrestling with, but he wants Jacob to know who he's wrestling with. He wants Jacob to know what he, what he is. He wants him to realize something. And so, Jacob says, when God asks him, what's your name? Jacob says, my name is Jacob. And the Amplified brings it out because this is what the, the Hebrew makes so clear that it's not brought out in our English translation. And in the shock of realization, the Amplified says, in the shock of realization, whispering, he said, Jacob, supplanter, schemer, trickster, swindler, all of a sudden it dawned on him. He's wanting God to bless that old swindler nature of his. Let me keep my Adam nature, Lord. Just you anoint it and bless it. And let me rule and reign with you. Let old Adam live. God said, uh-uh. It's got to be a change. That old Jacob's got to go. Got to be a new man happen. Hallelujah. That couldn't happen until after Joseph was born. Did you know until after Jesus came, no matter how good you were, no matter how much faith, you might have had faith enough to roll back the Red Sea. You might have had faith enough to call fire down from heaven. You might have had faith enough to shut the mouths of the lions. You might have had faith enough to bring the dead to life again. All those men back there in chapter 11, how the book of Hebrews did. And yet it said, they did not receive the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. What was it? Had to be a nature change. Amen. And they couldn't get that nature change until Jesus came. Those Old Testament saints couldn't go through that change of their nature. Because the Joseph hadn't been born yet. And Jacob couldn't wrestle with God and get his nature changed and his name changed to Israel, a prince with God, until after Joseph was born. Hallelujah. But after Joseph was born, after that shadow of Jesus came into the world, then Jacob met God and God said, Jacob, I want you to look at your nature. I want to see what you are. And Jacob said, my Lord, here I am a swindler, a trickster. I'm a cheater. My nature is wicked. He said, yeah, but you've been wrestling with God, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to cripple you. You know, you can't walk on your own like you used to. And he did. He touched him in his thigh. But, he said, I'm going to change your name. No more shall you be Jacob, but your name is going to be called Israel, a contender with God. Now we go to chapter 33. And again, uh, check, uh, rather, chapter 35. And again, God meets with Jacob. And this is on his journey here. And he's, uh, his wife is about to have another baby. Hallelujah. And God said to him in verse 10, Genesis 35, 10. And God said to him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called Je any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, just one minute. I want to remind you, he's got 11 sons. Okay? And yet God is saying to him, not you have been fruitful, you have multiplied, but he said, now, Jacob, I'm going to change your nature. You're not going to be Jacob anymore. You're going to be Israel. Now, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Hallelujah. All right. I'd about to get off on another 45 minutes there, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay right here with this. So he says, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Where do you think that Peter got his revelation in 1 uh, Peter chapter 2 and verse 9? Huh? When he said these tremendous words, listen to it. You are a chosen generation, people of God, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You, the sons of God, you, the Benjamin company, the younger brother, you are a holy nation. You're that nation that I told Israel would come out of his loins. A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. A royal priesthood. Kings and priests. Now he says, Jacob, Israel, be fruitful, multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings 
shall come out of thy loins. Not kings have come out of your loins, but kings shall come out of your loins. He's talking about another son's going to be born. He's talking about out of this son's going to come some kings. He's given us a picture here of what's going to happen with this younger son. And verse 16, they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Now, you know, it does not say anything about Rachel having hard labor when she was with Joseph. That was a joyous time, the birth of Joseph and that heavenly Joseph. The angels sang, the shepherds rejoiced, the wise men saw the stars and came. Oh, it was a time of peace on earth and was real to men when Joseph was born. But when, Jacob, when Benjamin's born, it's a time of hard travail for this one. I want to tell you, when Jesus came to this earth, it was the most beautiful thing that ever happened in the world. Civilization changed. Nations changed. Hospitals began to spring up. Hope sprung up for the human race. But I want to tell you what's happening to the world today. The world today is in hard labor. And that labor is going to continue until a son is born. Don't expect it to get better. Don't look for Carter or Kennedy or anybody else to set up a utopia in this land or in this world. This world's in hard labor. And that labor is going to continue. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Till the human race brings forth. Out of humanity, there's going to come a son, a younger son, a brother to Joseph, a full brother to Joseph. Not just a half-brother like Reuben and Naphtali and Gad and Dan and the rest of them, the ones that sold him, the ones that caused him to go down into the prison house. But I'm talking about a full brother. And Benjamin was the one brother out of all of his brothers that had nothing to do with him being sold into slavery. He wasn't there. The ten other boys were there, and they received each one of them two pieces of silver for their deed, a witness of their sins. Twenty pieces of silver they got for him when they sold him to the Ishmaelites. Two pieces apiece for the ten of them. Benjamin wasn't there. Hallelujah. It was that old nature that sold him down the drain, friends. He was crucified because of our old carnal nature, that nature of sin. There's a new man coming that had nothing to do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he purchased us and bought us by his blood to bring us into that new creation man. And so, hard labor is upon this. And you know, one other thing I've noticed about too, even though Rachel was blessed with the birth of of uh, Joseph God has taken that reproach if you follow her history you find out when she left Laban's house her father's house she took some of his idols with her she still had some idolatry in her how many of you know that even though you've been redeemed and born again and uh, bought by the blood of Jesus and your sins washed away still some things in there need to be cleansed hallelujah and I appreciate a place of deliverance some people say, oh, I've been born again. I don't need any deliverance. Look underneath. That's what you're sitting on. And find out there might be an idol under there. But I want to tell you something. She didn't have any idols in her house after she, uh, Benjamin was born. No. Because so she died. And I want to tell you something too, brother. That old nature is going to completely die before this new son or with the birth of this new son. There's going to be a death of that old nature. Hallelujah. All right. So it says, And it came to pass that she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. As she knew it was a son. 50-50 chance? She was just taking a chance? No, she wasn't taking a chance. Because this has been a prophecy. A word of the Lord had come. There's going to be another son. Amen. How do we know that this revival that God is doing now is going to bring a creation out of its bondage to decay and death and bring it into the glorious liberty of the sons of God because we have the word of the Lord on it. Amen. Because we have the word of the Lord. The Lord's already spoken about this. Hallelujah. There's going to be a son. All right? And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, which means the son of my sorrow. But his father said, Oh, no. He might have caused his mother sorrow, but he said, he's not going to be, that's not going to be his name. He's not going to be remembered always for the sorrow that came. There's going to be some joy. I want to tell you, there's hard labor in the world today, and the world doesn't know why. 
They don't know why. Other shortages. The, the energy shortages. Water shortages. Food shortages. Crime. And uh, drugs. And starvation all across the world today. They don't know why the world's in travail. There's no revelation coming to the heart that God's bringing forth a son. And they would call this if they said, well, yeah, if, if they had come to the realization, this is what's causing my travail. they say, that's a son of sorrow. That's a terrible thing to have around. Oh, no. The father said, it's my son of sorrow. Wait till it's over. He's going to be the son of my right hand. There's going to be joy that comes in the morning. I want to tell you, brother, God's going to make up for all the sorrow this world has ever seen for the joy that's coming in the morning. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. So his father said, no, his name won't be Benoni. It'll be Benjamin, meaning the son of my right hand. Now, uh, the peculiar thing about Benjamin, two places in Judges, I won't take time to read them. One place was a fellow by the name of Ehud, who had a left-handed ministry. He was a man left-handed. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. And then another place in Judges, it talks about 700 chosen men, Benjamites, all of them left-handed, could throw a stone at a hair's breast. And not miss. Amen. How many left-handed people we have here tonight? You're left-handed. Come here, brother. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> son of my right hand. The father said, he, Benjamin's going to be the son of my right hand. And how come that Benjamin's left hand was so anointed? Because it's the hand that's in the father's right hand. Amen. I want to tell you that there's a left-handed ministry that these people have, this company, this younger brother, there's a left-handed ministry. Amen. I don't know if I'll get to that tonight or not. Praise the Lord. But let me go on with this. And Rachel died. Now, we go on in the story and we find, as we continue on, that his brother sold Joseph down into slavery. And we go through Potiphar's house and we find that Potiphar's wife tempted him. He would not yield. He was not as the same cut and caliber as his brother's. Now, those ten brothers of his, they were just half-brothers. They were of the servants, they were of the law, and they were just half-brothers, and they went their own ways, and they had some wicked ways about them. But Joseph was not of the same caliber. And he didn't have the love for them that he had for that younger brother of his, that one that was of his mother, the one that had never had grown up and never known a real love uh, of a mother. Maybe Joseph might have been his mother to him. I mean, you know, Jacob with twelve sons, Jacob no doubt was pretty busy. And that little boy growing up around the house without a mother, all he had was an older brother. Any of you ever known a little brother that had a big brother that just looked after him all the time? Well, that's the kind of heart Jacob ha uh, uh, Joseph had. And I could just see that Joseph looking after that little brother. I know, I know this from the Scripture, that he loved that little brother with a passion. He, I'm sure that around there, he was all, he's like a mother to him. How many of you know that Jesus is like our mother to us? He's our mother, he's our father, he's our brother, he's our friend. He's everything, all right? But then Jake, uh, Joseph got sold down there to the Ishmaelites and went on down to Potiphar's house. They brought his coat back and said, We found this out in the fields full of blood. It looks like some animal got him. And so as far as Benjamin knew and as far as, as uh, the father knew, why, Joseph was dead. They didn't have any other testimony to that. Uh, the other brothers hid that dark secret in their heart, would never let that out, never told uh, the father. For years it went on, 20 years or more, it went by. Meanwhile, Joseph goes through the prison, and now he's up on Pharaoh's throne. And you know the vision, the dream that Pharaoh had, there was going to be seven good years, and then seven bad years. And Joseph said, what you need to do is get somebody to administrate this corn during the good years, store it up, build barns. Fill silos, store it all up, and then during the seven years you'll have plenty to feed the people. That sounded good to Pharaoh, and he said, I don't believe there's anybody who could do any better job at that than you. God's made me to know. Somebody, something makes me to know that you're the man that's got the ability to do so. He pointed Joseph to be the administrator. He said, you'll be rule over all the land. Only in the throne will I be greater than thee. So there he sat. And anybody wanted corn, they said, go to Joseph. The Pharaoh wasn't fool with it. The Pharaoh went out and played golf or something, see? Just went out and went fishing. He just went on a vacation. He just turned the whole work of it over to, to um, Joseph. And so, everything was done in Joseph's name. How many of you know that it pleased the Father? 
that in Jesus Christ all fullness is well. Hallelujah. And that everything is done in His name. I used to get worried about when I was a kid. I prayed so much to Jesus, and I thought, I wonder if the Father gets angry about that. I wonder if the Holy Spirit is, is uh, grieved with me, not ever praying to the Holy Spirit. Because I always prayed to Jesus. And, uh, and I worried about that for a while. Until I came to the revelation, see? Everything is done in Jesus' name. And that pleases the Father. And the Holy Spirit comes to testify of Him. And it pleases the Holy Spirit. And so everything was done in Joseph's name. And he was administrating it for seven good years. He collected all the corn up. And then the famine started. And they ran out of corn up in Canaan. And Jacob heard from the travelers coming through, they had lots of corn in Egypt. So he said to his ten older brothers, or his ten older sons, he wouldn't send Benjamin out. He kept him covered. He kept him close to him. But he sent the other ones out and said, go get corn. I want to tell you something. There was a younger brother that the world hadn't seen yet. He meets together in little camp meetings, and conventions, and store buildings, and houses, garages sometimes, sometimes church buildings. But the world doesn't see him. The world hasn't seen his exploits. He hasn't got out there and got all that corn yet. Because what he's going to do in his day is going to far exceed anything that they can bring back on their mules. Hallelujah. I'm coming to that. So, the ten boys went down with their money to buy the corn. And when they came in, Joseph recognized them. Now, he was 17 years old when they sold him into slavery. He was 30 years old when Pharaoh brought him out of the prison. That's 13 years. Seven good years. That makes him 20 years since he left home. And a year or two of famine. So now he's 21 years and passed since he left home. They don't recognize him. He wears Egyptian clothes. He's older. He looks Egyptian. He speaks Egyptian. In fact, he spoke to them through an interpreter. They didn't even realize that he could understand what they were saying while he was listening to their conversations. So, they came and they said, we want to buy corn. They said, who are you in here? He recognized them. He was looking at them. What have they done with my brother? Joseph, Benjamin's not here. Have they killed my Benjamin like they tried to kill me? What have they done with him? And he, got, he wanted to find out where Benjamin was. So he started saying, Who are you anyhow? Well, they said, We're ten brothers, all of one father, and we've come down to buy corn. We live up there. He said, I think you're a bunch of spies. You've come down here to spy out the land so that you could uh, bring an army in and get our corn. Oh, no, no, sir, Mr. Administrator. Oh, no, Mr. Governor, whatever they call him. said, Your Majesty, we're not, no. And they bowed down and said, We're all ten honest farmers, shepherds up there, and we just come to buy some corn. A likely story. Ten of you... All sons of one father? Is that all the sons he had, just ten of you? Oh, they wouldn't lie to this fellow for nothing. He seemed to be a guy who really had discernment. They said, no, he actually had twelve sons. Yeah. Where's the other two? Well, one of them's at home with his father. Oh, that's a relief. And the other, and bless his memory, is going on. He said, I don't believe a word you're saying, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a chance to prove it. He said, I'm going to let one of you go back and get the brother and bring him down here. So he put them all in jail for three days. But when the three days up, he brought them out. He said, I've changed my mind. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you go home. I'm going to keep one of you here. The rest of you go home. But he said, when you come back, you bring that brother with you or don't you come back. You'll not see my face until that younger brother is with you. You hear me now? Don't expect to look on my face till you bring that brother with you. And so he kept Simeon. That's interesting. Simeon means hearing. They lost their hearing. Did you know the church world today has lost its hearing? That's why it doesn't know what's going on in the purposes of God. Their hearing is all bound up. He bound Simeon up before their eyes. I ought to read some of this here to you to let you know I'm still in the Bible. Hallelujah. All right. And he says here, And um, he turned. They talked about this. See, Reuben answered him saying, didn't I speak to you saying, don't sin against a child and you would not hear? Therefore, also his blood is required. They were said, we are guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore, is this distress come upon us? And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. He turned away. Didn't you remember Jesus looking at Jerusalem and wept over Jerusalem and said, If you only knew your day, 
If you only knew the visitation when it came to you, and they didn't know that they were standing right there, and there was their brother. They didn't know. And he turned away and he wept. And then he turned back to him and he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take one of you. And he took Simeon. And he bound him before their eyes. Their hearing was bound. And he kept them there. And he sent the rest of them back home. And he said, now, let me tell you one thing. You're not going to see my face till you bring that brother. Hallelujah. They got back home. And they said, Dad, we got the corn. That's the good news. The bad news is we lost Simeon. And we can't go back until we take Benjamin. He said, you're not going to take him. I won't let him go. Hallelujah. Jacob, their father, said to them, Me have you bereaved of my children. Joseph is not. Sinning is not. And you will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spake to his father, saying, Slay my two sons if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. He's all I got left of my beloved. Here's my Benjamin here, and he's the only thing I got left of my beloved. I'm not going to let him out. Did you know God's got his people covered and he won't let them out? And you know, it's a good thing for us that God's got us covered because if the devil knew what this company of people was going to do to his kingdom, he'd be after every one of you trying to kill you before you got home. But see, he's dumb. He don't know how dangerous you are. And the kingdoms of this world don't know how dangerous you are. Or they'd strip you of everything you've got. They'd destroy your, uh, your little meeting places and everything else if they knew that you were out to destroy the kingdoms of this world. So, and the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt. Their father said to them, Go again and buy us a little food. You know, that's symbolic of the small vision that God's people have today. Just give us a little food. Overcomers! Marching triumphantly through the tribulation, putting our foot on the neck of the devil, uh, overcoming the Antichrist. Oh, they can't believe that. Just get us a, cor a corner in the cab uh, cabin over there in the corner somewhere in Glory Land. A little food. Just go buy us a little food. Well, he's got a lot more for you than that. We're going to find out. So he said, go buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. I'm going to make a prediction to you based upon what I see in this Word of God. We're all looking for Jesus, looking to look upon His face. All right? You expect them to see Jesus? I want to tell you something. According to His Word, you're not going to see the face of Jesus till the manifestation of the sons of God. Until that younger brother comes forth. The world wants to see Jesus. But there's going to first be a manifestation of the younger brother before they'll ever see him. Because you see, the great desire in Joseph's heart is to get that younger brother out of the place where he is over there and bring him up here and bring him up and sit him on the throne and help him to rule and reign over this land. He not intended to bring Benjamin down and make him a gardener. Or put him in jail. Or make a servant out of him. His purpose is to bring that blood brother of his down and bring him over again to help him to sit on this throne and rule this land. It's a pretty big job he's got. That's his purpose now. All right. So, they said, You shall not see my face except your brother be with you. And then they argued with Dad until Dad gave in and said, All right, said it's going to kill me, but go ahead and take him, but you better bring him back. So here they go. And they're nervous. Okay? And they go down again after some corn. It's a life and death matter. Do you know this world is facing life and death matter? Yeah. Right. This is not a game we're playing. This is not some religious fantasy we're chasing. This is life and death. I have seen people actually lose their lives in this move of God by turning their hand against God and turning away from God and getting out of the purpose of the God. I've seen them die. Amen. So anyhow, he, uh, here they go back to Egypt. And they come up... And so, Joseph sees them coming. He looks at them. There they are, ten of them. He's got Simeon here. And he looks, and there's that fine, good-looking, strapping young man, his brother. Now, his idea is, I'm going to get him out where I can keep him here. Let them go do their thing, see? Let them go out and play their religious games. Let them go out there and plant their little gardens up there and their little Canaan land. But I'm going to get him on the throne here with me. And here's how he goes about it. He has a big feast. And he sets them around the table. And, and they're amazed because he sets them in order of their birth, in their age, all the way around, in protocol, just like... And they don't know how he knows this. 
He does. They don't know how well He knows them. You know, a lot of people don't know how well Jesus knows them. They're in the most thoughts. They think they're getting Bible something, you know, their thoughts and their, all that. Well, anyhow, here we go. So they have this feast. And it says, They sat before Him, the firstborn according to His birthright, and the youngest according to His youth, and the men marveled one at another. And He took and set messes unto them from before Him. Messes means meals, you know. All right? But Benjamin's meal was five times so much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry. This is amazing. Now, I've had two boys in my family and got a couple of grandsons coming up. I know growing boys can eat a lot. I got one. I take him to Pizza House. I just can't understand where he puts it all. He's like Brother Glenn. He's skinny. And he'll eat twice as much as me and still stay skinny. And I can understand... That this boy, this younger brother, might have been really hungry and could have put away twice as much maybe as the rest of them had, but five times as much? No way. He, there was no way in the world that was he had the capacity to eat everything set in front of him. Do you know that God is going to do exceedingly abundantly above what you are even have the capacity to contain for that Benjamin company, that younger brother? That sons of God company, he's going to five, and five is the number of grace. And what you get is going to come by grace. It doesn't come because you're more holy. You're not going to get into the sonship company because you happen to know all the sonship scriptures, because you attend the sonship church, or because you made big donations, or that you preached it for 40 years. You don't get in that way. Paul makes it very plain in 1 Corinthians 1, if you make it in, friends, you're going to make it in by the grace of God. And when you stand before Him, you're going to have to confess, not by works, not by my brilliance, not by my understanding, not by the fact that I understood all the doctrines and I got in. Brother, there's going to be a lot of people get in don't even know what son, how to spell sonship. Right? And I can prove that to you from the Scripture because you see the baptism in the Holy Ghost is the first fruits of what I'm talking about. How many of you know that a lot of people get the Holy Ghost and don't know what they got till somebody takes the Bible and shows them why they're talking in tongues? No doubt somebody here has had that happen to them. I've seen it happen to a lot of people that received the Holy Ghost and didn't know what it was they had till somebody got and said, Here, here's what you got. It's right here in Acts 2 4. And that's the first fruits we're talking about. And there's going to be people that come into this thing not because they understood all about it, not because they knew all the scriptures and all of that travail for it all their life but because of their relationship with his older brother. Because of the grace of God that brought him in. Five times as much, he says, as any of their messes. And so, he commanded the steward of his house, said, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn's money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. Now, here's what happened. Not to read the whole chapter. But they started out of town the next morning. And they were in high spirits. They said, man, we got it made. Simeon's out of jail. Benjamin's with us. We're headed home. All 11 of us. We had all the beasts loaded down. As much corn as we can carry. And we're, we're, we're heading home. Now, fellas, be careful. So far, so good. Don't start any trouble. Any of the natives around here throw rocks at you, don't throw them back. Don't run any red lights. Anybody say anything bad to you, don't even talk back to them. Just let's be peaceful and law-abiding and get out of town and get on our way. All right? So here they go. And they're getting out of town. And they're on pins and needles, see? They don't know what... Boy, anything can happen. They've got to get this boy back to daddy. And so, on their way back, they get out of town a little ways. They get feeling better. City limits just passed by, you know, and they said, Well, we got it made. We're home free. Let's sing some of the songs of Canaan. So they break out singing, you know, and going along, and all of a sudden somebody was told to see the cloud of dust coming. Well, what's that? They soon find out. It's a steward with some soldiers. Comes running up there, charging up around their horses, and stops them and says, Hold everything. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's happening? Any trouble? Trouble? After our, my master treated you so good, feasted you, gave you corn as much as you can carry, and then, you dirty thieves, 
you would steal his own personal silver cup. What? We wouldn't do nothing like that. Anybody got a silver cup? No. You got it yet? No. Simeon? No. I wouldn't touch. Man, I was just wanting to get out and get home. Benjamin, you got it? No, sir. I haven't got it. Anybody? No. So they said, you go ahead. Search the sacks. You find that silver cup in any of our sacks, you can kill the guy that's got it and the rest of us will be your slaves. Big talk. Got our doctrines all straight. Now just let God try to tangle us up now. Ha! <laughs> You ain't gonna find no, you ain't gonna find no, no uh, quirks in our doctrine, boy. Bless God, we got it right on the wall. Right there it is. We believe number one, number two, number three, number four. That's it. No more. Search them. So they started the oldest, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, right on down. And finally, they're getting down towards the end. The fellows are tying up their sacks again, getting ready to go on. Come on, let's just get this show on the road now. Get through with it. And they come to the youngest one, Benjamin. The last one. Open the sack up and there's the cup. What? <laughs> Benjamin, how could you do this? Tell us, I didn't do it. I don't know why it's in there. I didn't put it in there. You think they believe him? You, you, you. You son of Rachel. Just like your big brother Joseph. Always causing trouble. Oh, what a reproach to be like Joseph. <laughs> Someone came up to me and said, you know, 13 years ago, I think it was, I was warned against you. They warned me you was a heretic and a false preacher and all. But you know what I was? I, I was, that false doctrine I was preaching, they said, he's preaching you can be like Jesus. Now, they never did, I don't know if anybody ever said that, that he preaches you can go out and get drunk and go to heaven. You can have two or three wives or women on the side and all that. I did have them come and accuse me of that one time up in Springfield from a fellow working in a, in a, Religious headquarters there. He out and said he'd been told down where he worked that I was at a harem. <laughs> he wanted to check it out. <laughs> but they never did say, well, he preaches, you know, that you can uh, just do any old thing and get by and go to heaven. But you know what he preaches? He preaches you can really be like Jesus. You can be just like his big brother. Praise the Lord. What a reproach to bear. A mother came to Jesus one time with her two sons. She said, Master, I've got a request. He said, what is it? She said, well, when you come into the kingdom, she said, would you put one of my sons on your left hand and one of them on your right hand? And he looked at those two boys whose names were James and John. And he said, fellas, are you able to drink the cup that I drink of and be baptized with my baptism? And they said, we're able. He said, well, I want to tell you something. He said, you're going to drink my cup. But to give that place on my right and left hand, so that's the father's to give. But he said, you can drink my cup. What is that cup? That's a cup of his reproach. Poor little Mary's. Bless her heart. Little teenage girl back there that had been overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. And the hour came when she could no longer hide it. I don't see her running in after her encounter with the Holy Ghost. And running in, and the angel Gabriel came there and gave her an announcement. I don't see her running in and saying, Mama, Daddy, guess what? I met an angel out there and he told me that's going to have a baby. No, I don't hear her say, say anything about it. Until one day, it simply says in the Scripture, very bluntly, she was found with child. She didn't say she announced she was going to have any. She was found. She was caught. You think her neighbors believed her story about an angel? Would you realize that the, the reproach that that pure virgin girl had to bear to bring the Son of God into this world? All of her life stained with that shadow of a mystery, how? Who is the father of this child? Do you know when Jesus was grown and grown up and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, that the Pharisees had that thing had been noised around, and they were throwing this up to him, saying, "We know who our father is. We're not born to fornication, right?" They threw. They still were throwing that up to him. That little girl had to bear that reproach her whole life long. She drank of a silver cup. Benjamin, sons of God, I want to tell you, there's a silver cup for you to drink of, to bear his reproach. Hebrews 13 says, going without the camp, bearing his reproach. Sure, I've carried a little bit of that reproach in my life and ministry. I rejoice in that. It's been very little 
compared to what I've seen other people have to suffer of the reproach of the gospel. Hallelujah. Frankly, I don't consider that I've been persecuted and that I've suffered. To tell you the truth, I've had a blast. Really. I've enjoyed myself these last 30 years of my ministry and, and, and the times of the, uh, of the trials and tribulations. I, I've learned things and I've had a blast. I've had a wonderful time. Never once did I ever look back and say, I wish I was back there in sin where I could be, you know, free and people would accept me and all. Never once. I don't, I don't think I've ever looked back and say, I wish I didn't have this. Hallelujah. I've had a glorious time. But there's been a cup of reproach to drink of. So they bundle all this stuff up, loaded the mules again, cast dust on their head, rent their clothing, and back into the city they went to face this man and the wrath of this governor. And so, when they got back, they began to plead with him. We don't know how this happened. This boy's young. I don't know what all they said. The scripture doesn't tell us a whole, all of it. No doubt they said this lad is young. He didn't understand. Please have mercy on us. We don't know how this thing got in his sacks. He claims he didn't do it. He said, well, you made the bargain that I could kill the man that did it and the rest of you be slaves. But I'm going to be more merciful than you are. Boy, was he ever more merciful than they had been to him. He said, I'm going to be more, more merciful than your judgment. You know, it's a good thing that carnal man isn't going to judge this world. It's a good thing the judgment's in the hand of God. I want to tell you. He said, all right, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to kill him. I'm not going to put you in slavery. I'm going to, I'm going to be merciful. I'm going to let you fellows go home, the eleven of you. This fellow that did this dirty deed, I'm going to keep him here and I'll make him a servant here. I won't even kill him. I'll just, I'll just make him a servant here. Make him work it off. But you go on home. Just go on and do your thing now. I'm going to keep him here with me. And that's what he was intending to do all the time. He worked all this out so he could get Joe, uh, Benjamin out from the rest of his brethren and get him up here on the throne with him. Let them go do their thing. Let them have their outer court ministry. Let them be keepers of the house. He's going to have a people, he said to Ezekiel, that's going to come into the Holy of Holies to me and minister unto me the rest of these ministries that have been unfaithful. He said, I'm going to let them minister to the house. But there's going to be a company that will minister to the house. They'll come into the Holy of Holies and minister unto me. And that's what his purpose was with Benjamin. Oh, glory to God. And then they begin to plead with him. You should read Judah's pleas. Judah. Did you realize it was Judah? There was a one that had suggested selling him to the Ishmaelites. He was the one who said, let's make some money on him. Let's sell him away. And now he's pleading for the life of his brother. Because he knows what dad's going to do. He said, sir, please, you don't understand. Our father won't live through this. We've pledged our sons. The life of our sons depend upon this. Our father's going to die of shock when we come back without this boy. And he begins, you ought to read his plea. It, it's pitiful. It's so pitiful that this Joseph breaks down, begins to cry. He says, get all the Egyptians out of the room. When all the Egyptians are out, and I tell you, he's going to separate the goat nations from the sheep nations. Hallelujah. He's going to, there's going to come a time when the Egyptians and the tares are going to be separated from the wheat. Hallelujah. He said, get all the Egyptians out. Now when he got all the brothers there, he unveils himself to them. He said, now look at me, fellas. And he begins to talk in their own language. <laughs> oh, bless God. And he says, then he says to them, don't you know who I am? Don't you know me? I've been with you all this time and you don't know me? And he said, look at me. I'm your brother. 22, 23 years ago, you sold me down here into slavery. You did it, you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. Hallelujah. It was God that put Jesus on the cross. They meant it to kill him, to get him out of the way. If the principalities and powers in heavenly places had have known the wisdom of God, they would have never had any part in crucifying the Lord of glory. Because they were bringing about the purpose and the will of God when they inspired those demon-possessed men back there to beat and crucify the Lord of glory. It was God that put Jesus on the cross, but he did it for good. They meant it for evil, but he did it for good. So Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. 
He said, God sent me down here. And he said, now I've got a place of safety for you. And the things that's coming upon the land, he said, go get dad and tell him I'm here and bring him down here and settle here. I'll get a good place fixed. I've got a land here uh, that's flowing with milk and honey for all of you. And, and on account of the fact that I'm going to have Benjamin sitting up here on the throne by me. That's what he's really going to say, see. I'm going to have him say, but the rest of you are going to be blessed. I'm going to have something for you too. I want to tell you the nations of the world are going to be blessed by what happens. And the, and the desires of this elder brother to get that younger brother on the throne is going to cause the nations of the world to be blessed. And there's going to be a land of milk and honey flowing for all the family of God. All of them are not going to sit on the throne. But all of them are going to be blessed. And so they went back, you know the story, and they came down there. But the thing I see in this story, dear friends, is a relationship between two brothers that transcended all the family activities there. This elder brother had such a passion to see that younger brother come from where he was to where the elder brother is. Come out of his place to come up here where I am. And didn't Jesus say, I go to prepare a place for you? That where I am... There you may be also. Oh, glory to God. God bless you for your patience. But I want you to realize this relationship with an elder brother. He's got a desire. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose for you. Would you bow your head? Hallelujah. For there are many, says the Lord, like Saul of Tarsus, going about in their own ways after their own vision and seemingly not even in the purposes of God. But I have my eye upon them as I did upon him. From his mother's womb I had chosen him. And I have chosen you, my beloved. For there are some here in the midst who have not yielded your lives to the purposes of God for this end time work of God. But my call is upon you and I will keep working, and I will keep drawing, and I'll tell I bring you to myself. Let thy spirit and thy heart be contrite before me, and resist no longer the drawing of my spirit. But son, my hand is reaching upon you now. You might cast aside your own ambitions and your own ways and your own thoughts and come unto me, and let me do for you far and exceedingly above what you have ever dreamed of. For lo, God is calling tonight to someone here. I wonder if we couldn't stand and sing. And as we sing, if you're here tonight, and if you need God, if you want to dedicate your life in a new way to the purpose of God, then come and give Him your heart and your life tonight. Come and say, God, I'm giving you a new dedication. I'm laying my life down. I want to be on the throne with you. He's calling somebody tonight. I don't know who it is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So would we sing?